Hello and welcome to my talk about uh, modern Linux networking. And this should be an update for the year uh, 2020. Um, I just want a show of hands. Who knows um, IP route command? Okay. Who has configured a serious switch in, of some sort? Show of hands, okay. Um, uh, does somebody use BGP? Okay, good. So probably you will learn something new today. Uh, that is great. Uh, for um, who has no idea about Linux networking? Okay, um, that's also good. Um, I hope I can uh, pick everybody up and. I'm sorry if it will get too hard in the end. Um, just uh, don't hesitate and stop me in between if you have any questions or any remarks, maybe corrections even. Um, I, I will be happy to answer any question and um, maybe the corrections, I'll, I'll be happy to, to write them down and uh, put it in the, in the org page later on. Um, the tool I am presenting it uh, in um, is called orcpad.com and um, this tool is written by the three uh, guys in, in the middle. So this, it, this will be a, a test basically if, if it uh, lives up to the promises. So what is this going to be for? Um, so some, most of you have an idea about networking. That is good. Um, I'll not uh, present on any single technology in great detail. So I'll just talk about the general concept. Maybe um, talk about some, some uh, cherry-picked details. But I'll not uh, offer any uh, in-depth um, information on on any any single technology because that is not impossible uh, that is not possible in in the two uh, two hours I, I have been given and I'll try to give uh, practical tips uh, I'll try to talk about stuff that is usable right now without being too much in on the experimental side so most of the stuff that that I'll show should be usable in something that is approaching production. But I'll not be responsible for any mistakes that you do and any money lost or time lost, OK? And as I, t as I said, uh, don't hesitate and ask questions in between. Um, if, if you'll ask more questions, then I'll talk about technologies, then that's great. Um, we, can, we can do it more interactively. So I try to put some context in here because, uh, bec uh, because of uh, people that maybe are not uh, that up to date. Um, I see more young faces here than old faces. So maybe the old Unix gurus that have for 10 years forgotten about uh, networking, um, maybe five guys in the whole room. So uh, I'll, I'll try my best. So. Where Linux comes from is a host operating system. And that means that uh, the, the main focus is on uh, providing applications, maybe databases, and uh, these, these traditional uh, operating, system, uh, operating systems tasks. But in the last uh, 15 years, maybe, uh, a certain area has developed, and that is uh, that uh, Linux evolves uh, as a network operating system as well. And in my opinion, which is just very rough, okay, so bear with me, and uh, I, there are no, ver no specific dates here. Um, my feeling is that this, this split or this development started around 2004 in for, for Euro. Okay, so 
in 2004, what happened was that uh, Linux overtook the HPC market, so high-performance computing, basically 60% of uh, high-performance computers in 2004 were uh, based on, on Linux or ran some so sort of Linux. Uh, the, uh, in 2004, also the first uh, release of Ubuntu happened. So for, for uh, the younger gen generation here, uh, that is maybe something that is interesting. Um, also, also uh, the, um, around that uh, time, the first release of OpenWRT happened. So the home routers, those small boxes, they, they started to be able to run Linux uh, from the hardware uh, standpoint of view. Um, and that is where basically this change happened. M many people realized, okay, come on, uh, Linux is maybe quite capable and maybe we can, we can uh, use it as a simple firewall we can, uh, besides hosting websites, databases, and so, so on. So in 2009, uh, the landscape looked quite a bit differently. Uh, virtualization uh, was, uh, um, became mainstream. So, um, most, of the, most of the virtualization platforms at that time were based in some form on Linux. So, as you know, VMware ESXi uh, is, is basically taking the Linux kernel and uh, adding some additional tools and so on and uh, using it for, for um, virtualization. Uh, KVM is uh, a part of the Linux kernel, um, Zen uses uh, most of the infrastructure from Linux. So, uh, obviously, this became quite it, it became quite clear that uh, Linux is, is the main frontier on, on this, uh, in this regard. Also, uh, the first release of Open vSwitch uh, happened, so there is a clear uh, development in that area. Okay, we need some um, more capable uh, switch management, and so Open vSwitch uh, project happened. Um, also, uh, Linux uh, was was quite um, was used extensively uh, in 2009 uh, on on uh, switches, firewalls, and so on, and that only became more of, uh, since then. Um, in 2009, uh, Docker wasn't a thing really, but uh, you had containers, um, and bear with me, I will talk about containers later on a bit. So maybe you heard that the Kubernetes talk before. Um, I don't know, but uh, this is not a containers talk. But yeah. Um, and then around 2014, uh, Docker Docker was a thing. Uh, people realized, okay, we have so much stuff happening on 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 a single Linux node. Um, that we need some more orchestration and Kubernetes and what, what not. Uh, even Microsoft realized, okay, well, uh, Linux is important for us and it actually makes us money. So they, they love Linux now. And um, they also did uh, in 2016 Windows subsystem for Linux. So there is a clear development in that area and it only becomes uh, broader uh, from, from year to year. And now, of course, um, I'll, I'll um, end this historical um, uh, talk. Uh, we, we are now landed in year t uh, 2020. And um, what, what's the point of all this history? So we now have on, on a single node, we might have a few hundred containers, every container has an IP address maybe, or maybe just a port forwarding. Um, so we need some, uh, we need some networking for this. We, it needs to be quite efficient. It needs to be manageable. It needs to be secure. Um, and it needs to be quite efficient as well. Yes. And um, here is where, where my talk comes in. So the, 
from the very beginning, I, I mean, Linux starts obviously at, at a certain layer, so uh, Linux is not hardware, so cabling is unimportant for us at, at this stage. But layer two networking, switching, is, um, is a thing where, where Linux plays a role. And we have, we have um, in the last five years, some uh, interesting developments in that area. Uh, we have um, a driver infrastructure uh, in kernel that allows us to speak to hardware uh, switches and configure them much in, in a detailed way. So anything we configure on some platforms, we can offload in hardware. So at that uh, point in time, it becomes quite efficient. So it makes, us, it makes lots of sense to, for instance, um, implement a firmware uh, of a switch with, uh, with Linux. And what this brings us as well is we can log in to this uh, Linux, have all the comfortable uh, tools as OpenSSH and so on that, that have patches and that can be upgraded actually and maybe even use Ansible and uh, other tools to, to manage this. And uh, what improved quite a bit is the built-in switching or uh, bridging infrastructure uh, in Linux with the addition of uh, VLAN filter. And I provided some uh, links in this, uh, in this bubble um, that you can read more about this uh, in a comprehensible manner about. Uh, but just, um, just to show some, some examples of this, um, the, the improvement that is happening with VLAN filter is that now the Linux bridge, which is basically a switch or, or a type of switch, understands VLAN tags. And uh, this is a very big improvement because you don't have to create a bridge for any uh, extra configured ports, but you create just one bridge and then say, OK, I, uh, this bridge connects these and these ports and they are in this VLAN. And then it connects other ports and they are in that other VLAN and so on. And you can also uh, isolate uh, certain ports on this switch so even though they are in the same VLAN, they are not able to talk to other ports. And uh, this improves uh, the management capabilities, basically, of, of, the, of the infrastructure. Because you don't have to write rules like ACLs and so on. You just say, OK, uh, this port needs to be isolated, and, then you, and that's it, OK? So I prepared a small example here. And I'll try to somehow manage the site and uh, and the, the example and hope that you can read everything. So scream at me if you cannot read anything. Is this readable? Maybe maybe a bit bit bigger. Okay. Uh, da -da -da -da. How do I make it bigger? Yeah, I, I think that's four tabs, <laughs> unfortunately. So, control plus. Much better. OK. Great. So, what do I have here? I have, um, I have just one interface, one physical interface. And I have this bridge here. And what I did is um, with, uh, with a sudo IP link add. So I, I just uh, maybe delete this one and then do everything uh, uh, again. Um, the, the I think. Okay. Um, so we don't have the switch anymore uh, or bridge. Um, okay, and I start from the beginning. 
So um, I will add a bridge named uh, BR0, and I'll add the uh, capability of VLAN filtering. That uh, so the bridge will understand VLAN tags. Okay, just let me quickly add add the uh, bridge. Okay, so actually you can filter. Um, um, IP show. And you, you can filter for filter devices of some type like that. So uh, just for for those that are new to these commands, uh, actually that is IP address uh, is is the resolution of uh, IP A. Uh, so, but if if you have written these commands a certain number of times, then you try to save uh, uh, on characters. Um, then uh, I'll add uh, a link to this to this bridge, so I I can do something and show you some how how it behaves. Okay, uh, because I need some I I would need to maybe create uh, virtual machines or uh, containers to have something to work with. Okay, um, I, I just want to uh, have this simple example. And so this enslaves a link, so to say. Um, this will be the wired interface that I obviously don't have, have not connected here, but that doesn't matter. And at this point in time, I can uh, show uh, how the bridge is configured. And you see that I have bridge zero, that is the typical VLAN one, and then one one interface that is enslaved, and that is also in the VLAN uh, one. And now I can add a VLAN tag, basically, or VLAN ID, and um, add on on a certain port or device link. Um, and that is in this case this device, and I'll add uh, VLAN ID 1000, and it should be the default uh, default uh, ID, and it shall be untagged, and it should um, the state should uh, change with the bridge. So if the bridge goes up, then the interface should also become active. And what happens here is obviously the VLAN changed, and this is what what you see. So what what uh, now you ask yourself, okay, uh, this is easy. So uh, I'll try to break it maybe. Um, what what happens when I try to assign a tag that is maybe five thousand? And as you know, ten bits. Uh, there is, it is not possible to assign uh, the tag five five thousand. So that just just to make sure, I'll I'll show you if if I can assign actually uh, some some crazy number. And uh, as you see, it works. It has some error handling, so it is uh, robust. Maybe in some some sense, maybe I'll try to add minus one. Okay. Um, this is comical. This is not a range. Okay, so there is a hint. I can configure more VLAN tags at once, and that is helpful when you uh, configure uh, connections between switches, where you want to actually uh, send the tags over a wire, uh, so other switches can also connect in the appropriate uh, VLAN. And what you can do is. Uh, now it doesn't make sense to assign it um, uh, the physical uh, VID, or um, so uh, it makes sense, for instance, to assign the IDs from 2000 to 2020, and um, that that's it. Okay. So we show these, and now you see. Okay, one is the the default. 
the default is still still 1000 and the other ones are just uh, available on this on this interface so i think this is this is quite interesting you can also also uh, give a list with a comma and then you can say okay i need 1000 1100 and then 2000 and that's it and don't give a range but you cannot combine those so you need to first give a list and then a range maybe or the other way around just uh, so that's all about a bridge um, maybe two things that i uh, find interesting with this uh, vlan filtering capability is um, you can add options uh, to um, protect against um, bridge uh, protocol data units so that is for instance if you run spanning tree protocol over uh, your infrastructure then on some ports uh, where client devices connect or uh, where where some some uh, unmanaged switch uh, connects you want to block uh, certain uh, these spanning tree protocol uh, units and uh, so you can you can guard against that and also you can as i as i said uh, create isolated ports and for instance if you if you buy uh, uh, hardware uh, platforms that are supported in cumulus linux then you can count on uh, offloading these uh, commands to hardware so it becomes quite efficient and you can you can switch on line rate and don't have to process it on the on the processor so i think this is this is quite great okay when you talk about uh, these physical uh, network realities uh, it, it's ethernet basically still uh, then it becomes quite in interesting nowadays to talk about VXLAN and what this is is a virtual uh, virtual LAN above a rooted network so what what happens here is you encapsulate layer 2 traffic Ethernet frames in UDP and send those UDP packets over uh, a different infrastructure basically uh, to uh, the destination so you create a type of tunnel and um, this can help you for instance to uh, create a connection between data centers over uh, some links that are not ethernet based but can still uh, root uh, packets or where, where you don't want to have a single ethernet broadcast domain something like this you can the, the i also provided a blog post here that is that is quite detailed and is very um it is quite simple uh to to read and there is everything you need to know just one thing that is quite important in my point of view for this is uh, the udp port was standardized later than the implementation happened in linux so when the implementation happened in linux around year 2012 uh, the the port was not set and was some 8000 something and um, the default basically didn't change since then so when you when you want to be compliant with the standard nowadays you still need to specify the port because otherwise you will take the old number and it will not work and you will probably spend hours and hours searching why why does it work and uh, looking at tcp dump and so on so keep this in mind um, I'll talk about VXLAN in connection with other technologies a bit later. I just wanted to um, tell you that this is this is an important piece of technology that um, that is relevant later on in my talk. Uh, one thing to keep in mind uh, that is dif uh, different or making a VXLAN a bit different to other uh, tunnel technologies is or overlay network technologies maybe is that uh, that vxlan is usually supported in quite cheap hardware as well 
So you can offload the processing of VXLAN traffic to hardware and basically uh, use your complete uh, processing capacity. Another, now, now we go a layer up in a, in a certain sense because VXLAN was basically between layers um, or using more layers uh, depending on how you look at it. Now uh, I want to talk more about uh, routing and uh, in routing quite a lot of stuff happened as well. Um, 2015 or, uh, or so, um, Cumulus Linux implemented uh, the virtual routing and forwarding in Linux. And what this is for is that you used to maybe write policy routing um, rules. Uh, so to, uh, if, I'll start differently. Uh, if you have a packet coming in and you need to, you want to route this uh, packet depending on what source address it comes from, so maybe, or what destination address it, it needs to be routed to. And maybe you have important traffic that needs to take a fast path and that is paid bet, uh, quite well by your customers, or you have uh, management traffic that shouldn't go a certain route because that's insecure or uh, something like this, then uh, you would probably use policy base uh, policy routing before, or you would use uh, network namespaces, which is in, inefficient in in quite many cases. Or since about 2015-16, you would you have the option to use virtual routing and forwarding in Linux as well. Uh, this is actually quite an old technology that was available on higher end routers and switches, uh, layer three capable switches. Uh, but uh, but we waited uh, for this technology quite a long time in Linux. And what what this makes is it separates um, the routing tables in Linux. Um, so you basically create multiple routers in one, on one uh, single Linux instance. And what this enables you, you can forget all your uh, policy routing in most cases and just basically separate uh, the routing uh, tasks and uh, the, the separation comes naturally then. So for instance, if I want to uh, make SSH available only on, um, on a management network, I would put a manage, management network port in a special uh, VRF, give it an ID and say, okay, launch SSH, only listening in this uh, VRF. And it would only be available from your management uh, network, for instance. Um, the, the nice thing compared to network namespaces uh, is that you only separate the routing part in the Linux box and not, uh, not, interfa not uh, the layer two interfaces, not uh, sockets and other stuff. So you don't, you don't need to launch your daemons, uh, routing daemons and everything per network namespace or per container you can launch one uh, instance of it and it can listen in uh, the default VRF on in, or in a different VRF or you can provide routing between these VRFs. Uh, that is called route leaking if you want to search for it. Um, which is still a lot more elegant than writing policy, uh, the policies for, for special routing decisions. And because it's so, so simple and was supported in uh, routers for, for a long time, it also can be offloaded to hardware in many cases. And this makes all, the, all, these, uh, all this processing quite efficient. And for instance, on uh, Cumulus Linux, you, you wouldn't need to go to, um, to software uh, routing 
and it would, it would provide bet much better latencies as well. Um, where you use vir uh, virtual routing and forwarding is uh, with VPNs as well. Uh, you terminate a VPN, virtual private network, in a VRF, and then uh, if you if you create a VPN for each customer of an ISP, for instance, so that every customer of of an ISP can have their network spanning maybe half a Europe, then then they are still separated from every other customer uh, in an efficient manner. And, uh, and they can have the same address space can be used in each VRF um, because they are separate networks, basically, from the routing standpoint of view. So this is a big advantage. And... Um, it enables uh, a lot more easier uh, management of, of these big networks. It actually, it makes it uh, possible at all, because you, your customers, they want to use at any address uh, they, they think of uh, in the private space, or um, they don't want to consult you what address they can take um, if, if it's just some internal infrastructure. And so I talked about uh, VXLAN and I talked about VRF and um, I want to talk about a special routing uh, technology that um, uh, is called eVPN. And uh, as I talked about uh, these VPNs in the VRF context, uh, Ethernet VPN is a special special technology that is using BGP, uh, the Border Gateway uh, Protocol, but it doesn't propagate information about IP addresses and their reachability, but about MAC addresses. And this is actually quite efficient if you use technologies like uh, VXLAN uh, together with it. What you can do is in the combination of eVPN and VXLAN, you can create tunnel, many, many tunnels between um, hosts, containers, and so on, and propagate the information about these tunnels over, over great distances and make sure they converge. Uh, the, the information is quite consistent or becomes consistent in a fast and scalable manner. We know how to scale BGP to the whole internet, so obviously this, this has a potential to work um, and actually is used extensively as well. And um, this enables eVPN together with VXLAN also enables um, to make the Ethernet bro broadcast domains quite small, basically just um, between a host and its port, if you want to, or just between two nodes on, on one piece of wire. And as soon as you leave uh, your virtual machine or your container, you can, you can be in a virtual network that is a lot more scalable and manageable than uh, the physical network that is actually um, the underlay of all this. So you just provide uh, one, one physical network, and on top of this underlay network, you provide a virtual network that is a lot more scalable, manageable, and um, yeah, actually. Yeah, manageable at all or um, realistic in the context of hyperscale uh, clouds and so on. EVPN is um, available on, uh, on uh, open source uh, routers. Uh, so there is a project that is called FR uh, Free Rage Routing. Um, and this is, this is a software package that can uh, do BGP with the eVPN capability. 
So you don't have to pay anything. You can install uh, FR uh, routing on, on your typical CentOS or Debian or whatever. It's even in the stable repositories nowadays and um, use it. Uh, just be aware that the uh, EVPN capability came in around the 5.0 version, which is more or less recent. It's maybe one and a half years old, so maybe you need to import a newer package from your repository or compile it from source, which shouldn't be uh, too hard. Uh, I linked a great post uh, that summarizes what I have talked about um, in uh, concerning VXLAN and EVPN and some other technologies I mentioned uh, in, in a talk that is approximately one hour long, so I will not reproduce everything from it, but the, the ideas are uh, uh, summarized nicely in there in English as well even though it's actually a German network operators group. So. And now um, to connect all the dots, VXLAN, EVPN and uh, VRF, what you can do is now you can, instead of using the typical approach, which is to use multi-protocol multi label switching, you could now replace this whole infrastructure on, Cis on expensive uh, Cisco or Juniper boxes with just Linux, with VXLAN, BGP, and VRF. And with a bit of luck and some development, you could uh, do a scalable infrastructure that could be comparable to MPLS networks nowadays. I, uh, you are laughing in uh, here, maybe you want to correct me. Uh, you can also uh, say it in Czech or other, and I will translate. Um, that, that's fine, I mean, that's, I, it shouldn't be a talking head uh, uh, session here. It, if you want to interact, then go ahead. Um, I, the problem is, with VRF, you have no, no uh, way to tell other boxes what, what VRF ID you are using. And maybe that's where you, where you uh, see the, uh, the problem. Um, I'll, I'll put this differently. Maybe I lost some of you because, because you are not using this technology and um, are not proficient in it. Uh, if you have more routers on your box, you have no way to tell other boxes using IP protocol that you are basically more routers in a single box. And how you do it is you do um, VLANs or something where, you, where every other VLAN goes into a different routing domain. And this, this is one way to separate uh, routing domains, but that is that is not very elegant and doesn't scale much. So you have maybe four thousand tags, and then that's game over. Okay. Uh, so if you if you are an ISP, you don't you probably want more than four thousand customers. So that is not very nice. Or you can configure the and then you need to ob obviously configure the VRF on every single uh, router along the way. So that is called VRF light in some white papers and so on. Because it sounds kind of good, but it tells you, okay, you need to pay 10 times more to get a good VRF. What you can do is you can uh, combine multi-protocol label switching and VRF together to provide these layer two VPN, uh, layer three uh, VPNs or even layer two VPNs actually. And what multi-protocol multi label switching is doing is it adds a label to, to a packet and um, basically encaps encapsulates the traffic. So what you can do is you can, for each VRF, you can have a different label and the, uh, then use your typical MPLS infrastructure 
that is quite common for, for uh, big carriers and so on. Send your packets as you are used to, uh, to the other side of the world. And when, when the packet comes in, then you can look at the label and say, okay, uh, this is label 100, so it needs to go to VRF domain 100. And, but you don't have to keep uh, the, uh, the VRFs configured on every single router along the way that you are maybe not even managing at all. Uh, or maybe some, some other department is managing it. So this is an improvement. And a similar thing is with uh, VXLAN, because uh, what, what you are doing, you are basically sending UDP packets. Um, there are some caveats. Uh, MPLS has capabilities for uh, traffic engineering and so on, but so does BGP. So if you combine these technologies, then um, which is coming uh, coming uh, around this time actually that that um, big uh, uh, cloud operators and so on are actually skipping MPLS and so on and going to EVPN VXLAN and so on and managing their much bigger infrastructures around the world uh, with these technologies. Uh, Ad, uh, additionally to some other technologies they probably developed along the way, but they are not standard usually. So uh, I talked about all these um, uh, layers and all these difficult protocols and now, it, now uh, something a bit easier comes in so you can wake up <laughs> and uh, breathe in and um, have something that is maybe more um, usable for, for a day-to-day -day life in, in a typical small data center. Um, it's called LLDP and it's used uh, to communicate about reachability between nodes. So just if you want to find out what nodes you are connected to, then you can basically use two technologies uh, that work m most of the time. Uh, it is uh, CD, uh, CDP, uh, the Cis Cisco Discovery Protocol, or LLDP, which is uh, standards-based. Uh, and the uh, Discovery Protocol basically tells you, okay, I'm connected to other nodes over it Ethernet, and the other side is uh, called Switch1, and it is a Cisco switch, it is a Catalyst uh, 2960, and it has this and this IP address maybe. And it's connected to this and this port. And this is everything, you, uh, you don't even have to configure routing for this, you don't, uh, so it's, you just have to activate the daemon. And there you go. So you can find out, am I actually connected to the right host, uh, or to the right switch? Uh, you can find out, yeah, am I connected to the server I think I'm connected to? And uh, basically check your cabling with, with the help of this and don't have to maybe walk 10 kilometers to the other end of the transceiver and uh, check it physically. Because at this point you don't have a connection, so what do you, uh, routing connection, so you don't, you cannot connect over SSH or something maybe. And just a uh, you can install an LLDP daemon on any Linux nowadays. There are multiple uh, projects that provide different LLDP daemons, um, but uh, you can the LLDPD or Open LLDP daemons. They are uh, available in most uh, projects like CentOS, Debian, and so on. Just keep in mind that some mainstream NICs they actually have a LLDP daemon. Uh, on the network interface card uh, that is running on the chip that you cannot control in, uh, in great detail. And it basically sends LDP information out, uh, but it just says, okay, I'm an Intel network interface card and it doesn't tell you much, okay? So because maybe you have a full rack of, uh, of, the, of the same uh, uh, network interface card. 
So you can turn this off in, uh, in the host uh, operating system and then provide your LLDB uh, daemon and configure all the information in there. So that is just a thing to keep in mind. Okay. So this is where I go to, where I skip to different themes altogether. I talked about some technologies that are available in Linux that weren't there maybe five years ago. Now I'll talk about uh, technologies that are present for a very long time, but I'll talk about misuse of these technologies and uh, stuff that I um, stuff that is maybe not that common to use these tools for. And I want to talk about IPs and, and NF tables in here. Where you use IP sets is usually if you want to blacklist something or if you want to whitelist something and want to do it efficiently. You don't want to provide a rule for every single uh, entry in this list. You want to just have one rule and then a list of IP addresses, ports, combinations of those, and um, want to do any, something with this, and it should be efficient. What you can also do is you can create these lists dynamically. And so I thought about uh, using, using these capabilities that are built in on most operating, um, on most Linux installations out there for debugging purposes. Um, maybe you have a problem nowadays that you that somebody tells you, okay, you have ransomware in your in your network somewhere. Because you the the people that want to consult you, they maybe haven't really configured their logging and the firewall isn't that nice and so on. Then you come in and say, okay, well, what can I do in, a, uh, in the short period of time that I have been given to tell them, okay, it's bad or it's not that bad? Uh, well, you could use IP set. If, um, if you can install a simple Linux box somewhere in, in between or if, uh, make a mirror port on a switch and send the traffic to a, to a, a different box, then you can, you can actually provide a small uh, testing device where you can, you can create an IP set dynamically from the traffic that you receive. And what this can be interest, interesting for, maybe uh, some ransomware uh, types, they access a certain port. Um, they tend to access many different IP addresses uh, over the internet on the same port, mostly. Not, not always, but that is what I have seen. And so an IP set would be interesting in this regard because it's in kernel, so you don't skip to user space. It should be quite efficient. You can create huge lists, so one million entries. Uh, it's, it's not nice, but it's usable, um, and it's five lines of configuration, so uh, it should be easy. So, okay. So what what you can use, but the the IP set has a limitation. Um, if you want to save the source IP address. The, des uh, the source port, then the protocol, and the destination IP address and destination port, then uh, there is no type for this in IP set. I have actually written to the authors, but I, I haven't received any reply. I guess they just are not very interested in, in adding some new types to IP set. And I'll explain later why that may be the case. Uh, but what you can do is a sort of hack. Uh, you can you can say okay I'll I'll do two sets and one set will have uh, the source IP address and source port and just the destination IP address and uh, the other set will have for matching purposes 
uh, the destination uh, or the source uh, IP address, but destination IP uh, and destination IP address, but destination port instead of uh, source port. And when you combine those, uh, those um, when you overlap these two lists, then you have a certain uh, overlay, uh, overlay or um, combination that that is that is likely or probable that 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 was actually the connection that you are looking for. That is not very nice, and it's it just in it's still not a certain thing. But it's uh, but it uh, makes the search area much much smaller. Um, so, if you want to have a look at this, this is actually how how you can create these uh, dynamic sets. Um, I'll, you, I'll I'll share the whole org page so you don't have to take pictures and it will be on the recording as well. So uh, you can you can copy paste later on. Um, and yes, and I, I haven't found this approach anywhere else. So I think that is actually some, something new that you can take from this talk. Maybe it's not interesting for you because you are using NF tables now. And uh, NF tables is uh, the new and shiny firewall uh, in Linux kernel that is a lot more capable and uh, can be can be configured in a nicer way for instance it can be adjusted atomically in the kernel which is uh, which is nice uh, for consistency reasons and uh, what can, what you can do here you can specify sets um, with concatenations of types so what you can do is you can actually uh, create the set you want from some basic types. And what, what I do here is I use uh, the type of IPv4 address, the inet service, which is basically the port, then the inet protocol, which is TCP, UDP, and some address maybe, and then, of course, the destination IP address and destination port. And... Um, I think I could uh, I could uh, try to show you this live in a demo. So wish me luck. Um, so sudo nft list rule set. I want to look what I have configured. Maybe I have forgot that I. Have something there? No, I, I don't have any rule set now uh, active. Uh, so I want to add a, a special table that is called monitoring. Um, NFT add table monitoring. And so, of course, empty table. Nice. Um, then I want to add a Add uh, some specification to a, to a specific hook, or um, this is basically a chain here. Add a chain monitoring that is in the table monitoring, of course, and it should be hooked to input. Uh, it should be uh, of type filter uh, priority. Zero, and now you have to do this syntax correctly. Okay, nice. And I'll add uh, the set that I specify now. Add set uh, monitoring. Yeah, nice name, my set, okay. Uh, of type IPv4 ad address, the dot is a concatenation of these types. Uh, in that service concatenation proto 
IPv4 address and in a service. And then I want to specify some additional uh, flags. I want to say this should be a dy dynamic set. Uh, flag dynamic. And then I want uh, need to close this. So let's hope I haven't. Yes, of course, I cannot type flags. Okay. And now uh, I want to add a special rule that adds entries to this to this set dynamically. Everything that goes to input should uh, go to this set. Uh, rule monitoring input add, and then to this set is with the add sign, and it should be IP source address concatenated with a special hack or thing that enables you to read an offset into the header of of um, of uh, a transport header. So that is the th transport header offset of zero and uh, until 16. So what that, what this does is it reads 16 bytes, uh, 16 bits, and interprets it as a number. And that is of course the uh, source port uh, in in UDP in a UDP or TCP packet, and that's the whole point because I don't want to tell okay this is TCP or UDP. I want to say okay look at the transport uh, protocol and read. Uh, just this number, and uh, it's I am uh, indifferent if it's TCP or UDP. So it should it's one rule for both protocols. Um, TH zero sixteen. I'll try to be quicker. Proto protocol IP address destination address of course, and then. TH 16 and 16, that's it, the destination port. And then I want to also attach a counter. So I want to say, uh, or save some information about how many bytes that was and how many packets. So let's hope this works. And now I have a rule set. And because I haven't probably done any traffic, then I want to. Create some traffic, maybe, and that should work. And then I have some addresses in here. Uh, okay, I will make this a bit larger that you can read it. And you see, okay, yes, I, I, there is no slowdown basically, but I still have this information about, okay, what Ars Technica IP address. Uh, of course, it's a web server, so 443. Uh, TCP session and uh, my IP address is obviously this one here, and um, <coughs> yes, so that is that is just one uh, direction of the of the communication. So I, I think this is interesting because yeah, it's it's easy to um, paste those four lines and then you have all these information and. Uh, Is this interesting? Will you use uh, IP sets or NF table sets in production somewhere? Okay. Yeah, I was just thinking, uh, uh, functionally, uh, I could use NF set, uh, sets in NF tables the same way like I use sets in IP sets. Is that right? Or? No, uh, because IP set is a module in uh, in IP tables, and I have the feeling that basically the development more or less isn't. Uh, there is some upkeep of IP sets, but not really a, a new development because otherwise they would be interested in adding maybe a type that is the full uh, five tuple.
Yes, but you would need to translate uh, your sets. And um, that is actually a good question. I, I think um, you can translate IP tables rules uh, in a very easy way. There is an automatic translation, uh, and it should work for most rules. But uh, there is no such tool for IP sets. So uh, if you have large IP sets and in a certain form and uh, style, then excuse me, you want to uh, probably write some script that transforms those into uh, the format that is uh, used by NF tables. Actually, IP sets, I have some interesting observations considering IP sets uh, in, in the preparation for this talk. Uh, I, want, I actually created uh, IP sets that have had one million records uh, and imported them into the kernel. Um, so that was the um, three tuple uh, IP, uh, IP port IP. So what I talked about, the, these uh, two blacklists, uh, basically. And what I found out is that if you uh, use IP set restore and put in this uh, huge list of IP addresses that is just, you know, um, a few hundred megabytes, uh, then it takes tens of minutes to import this into, into the kernel. But it finishes. So uh, you don't want to list that. There is a special command where you can just list the header of, of an IP set, where it says, um, about uh, the size of the table, how, how, uh, so how, how many elements you have, how much space it takes in memory, and so on. Um, it's not very nice, uh, so to say the least. I hope I haven't done the same measurement for NF tables, but I hope um, this will be much quicker because I, I don't see a reason why that takes so long. I think there must be some great inefficiency. I apologize because I wanted to talk about uh, tracing uh, concerning exactly these areas uh, in the kernel, but I, th I don't think that is uh, reasonable in two hours to open another such a big uh, theme. And uh, so I haven't looked into the tracing of this issue uh, in detail. So sorry, I promised that in the um, ad, ad, uh, abstract of the talk, and that is one thing I will not deliver. So, of course, all these uh, all these things I talked about, you could probably uh, realize with uh, Snort or Suricata, which are uh, intrusion detection or intrusion prevention systems. Uh, you could filter what what is interesting for you, or you could you could probably uh, use PM Act, which is written for ISPs, Internet Service Providers, uh, exactly for uh, stuff like this, where you need to log what IP, what port did what traffic to <coughs> what other IP and what port, for for uh, legal reasons maybe and so on. Um, also on switches, hardware switches uh, provide a protocol that is called SFlow or uh, NetFlow. Uh, they, um, they, every time a flow gets created, a flow is uh, basically IP, uh, source IP, source port, a destination IP, destination port, uh, and a protocol. Every time a new connection gets created or packets travel, then you have a flow. And the switch can, in hardware, log these flows and inform you about uh, the creation of a new session and so on. And that is quite efficient. And you can save these flows with uh, PM Act, for instance, so, and analyze them later from MySQL database or whatever you want. Uh, but it's a lot more complicated that, than f for the quick debugging the four lines of some simple rules and then maybe some scripting, because maybe you are just interested in a small snapshot. Okay. Are there any questions if in this regard? The last thing I want to talk about is uh, 
namespaces, network namespaces, to be concrete. And these are used extensively in combination with other uh, namespaces in, in containers. That is basically what co Linux containers are about. It's not like one thing and then you get the whole package, but you actually have to glue multiple components together and then you have a container. Um, if this theme interests you more, then you can uh, contact or read the blog of uh, Jessie Frazel. Uh, she writes about Linux containers in great detail and I guess you would see some interesting links there as well to further your study. Or you can listen to talks of Kubernetes and Docker and stuff and inf inform yourself. What name, uh, network namespaces are interesting uh, for is, uh, in my opinion, that is not so traditional for, uh, for simulation. Maybe you have a single box that has certain amount of RAM that is, um, uh, that is larger than your typical laptop maybe. And you can simulate hundreds of hosts with uh, network namespaces because what what happens is you separate all the networking functions of the Linux kernel and create separate instances of these. And that is basically the definition of a host from the network point of view. Because you are not interested in separate time or in separate disk space or pa uh, uh, how you look at file systems, but you are very much interested in how the routing behaves between hosts and so on. Then you would maybe use uh, the VLAN ever switch or OpenV switch to configure uh, the connections between these, um, be between basically these um, simulated hosts and um, uh, maybe a VRF and uh, stuff like that. And uh, then you, you can, with IP exec or IP net NS exec, you can uh, basically log into a con container or name namespace in this uh, in this uh, matter, and execute ping, execute uh, SSH, execute web servers uh, as if they were in a di on a different host, basically. And um, there is also a project Mininet. Uh, that um, that um, automates some of this, uh, makes it easier to set up, and has some built-in topologies that you can create very easily. Uh, the typical tree-like topology or the dual uh, star topology and so on. Um, so I think this, this could be interesting for you if you want to have a sense of Okay, this this will this will actually work in production, and, but I don't want to buy all these uh, expensive switches and hosts. Um, it's basically on every Linux host that you can find nowadays, so it's available as well. And yes, but it eats much more RAM than simple VRFs. With that, I would like to end this talk, but I would be more than happy to uh, create a discussion maybe in, in the time we have left, or you can talk to me later or tomorrow. Um, yeah, thank you for, for your patience. And um, I know it was a bit uh, jumpy uh, from the theme point of view, but um, that is how, how networking is. You have, to, you have to keep many themes in your head and you have to be flexible enough to uh, delve into new ideas. Thank you. <laughs>